we got to stop looking at our flesh like that guilty pleasure. Don't send it to timeout. Oh, you've been naughty, right? Don't, don't give it a strongly worded email or a demerit. Kill it where it stands with no mercy because it's either kill or be killed when it comes to the flesh. So, um, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is where we're going to be today. If you got a note sheet, you can take notes, no pressure. All the cool kids are doing it, but uh, you don't have to. Uh, but we are continuing this series called uh, Paul's Greatest Hits. And um, nobody's asked me this yet, but I, I, I can't help but wonder if you've wondered, like, okay, why Paul? Like, why, why not Jesus? I thought this was about Jesus. I thought everything was about Jesus. Why, are we, why do we keep talking about Paul? Why is he getting all these shout outs here? And uh, I don't know if you've ever read Paul, but he's kind of a big fan of Jesus. He talks about Jesus a lot. And, and so what you'll notice is Paul always finds a way to bring it back to Christ in whatever he's talking about, which I think is something good for us to pick up, but also because Paul is the, the apostle to the Gentiles and we're Gentile. You're not gentle, some of you, but you're Gentile, right? You're, uh, you're a non-Jewish person or from, not from the nation of, of Israel. And so uh, Paul was sent by Christ to us so that he could communicate the gospel, so he could show us the way, and so uh, the way to Jesus. And so a lot of his stuff sticks out and, and pops with us. And we've been going through, now this is the sixth week, we've been taking different verses from all parts of his letters and, uh, and figuring out what they mean and why they're such a big deal. Uh, and as we near the end, I think we'll do a week, maybe two more, uh, but we're going to have, uh, what we're noticing is the verses that we're getting to are a little less widely popular, like you might, some of these verses that we're starting to read, you may not have actually heard if you're new to this Christian thing, new to this, this Jesus guy. But if you pursue him honestly, and if you're serious about following Jesus and not just showing up to church every once in a while and ticking a box, the verses we're going to talk about, the more you do it, the more you, these become foundational, the more powerful and useful and helpful they are because this is a whole thing following Jesus, right? It's not just the conversion and you're done. There's a lot more to be fleshed out. And so we're talking today uh, from Galatians 5. And, and, and I want to just go ahead and jump in with verse 16. Um, you might not, again, recognize some of the stuff. You, you might recognize some of the verses near the end. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about what it all means. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says this. So I say... Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite to what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your own good intentions. But when you're directed by the Spirit, you're not under the obligation of the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, dropping your pen. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I lost my spot. Um, anger, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. That last verse or two is probably the ones you've heard. Um, they're probably, I bet you're right. I call those the Hobby Lobby verses. You could walk in Hobby Lobby right now. There's some random painting of a pear and apples, fruits, you know, an arrangement of fruit we never have in our own houses with Galatians 5.22 on it, right? <laughs> fruits of the Spirit. And then Paul says at the end, if he was born in Chatham County, he would say, and there ain't nothing wrong with that, right? Like, ain't none, these, these are good things. And so that's why that verse is popular because we all like love and joy and peace. And, and, and so we like those things. And that's the popular standout verse. That's his hit, so to speak. But 
Really, funny enough, that's not the main point of this whole section of this part of his letter. There's actually so much more uh, going on here that points us to this, that shows us um, a principle that we need to all understand for your lives and your relationships with God and your Christian walk. You know, last week we talked about evangelism, right? With, with Paul's verse about, I've become all things to all people so that by all means I could save some. That's like a Freedom Family Church verse if I ever heard one, right? Like that's what we do. That's, that's a lot of why we do what we do. But today is really more about you. And can we talk about you you know we can, because that's what where we default to, right? We want to know about our, our personal walk. And there is a personal angle here, and there's a reality that I think some Christians, unless you've read this and understood this, you don't know what's going on. And so we want to make sure that we understand the situation that we're in. And Paul makes it very clear for us. And so you've got blanks on your sheet if you want to follow along. The first thing I want you to understand from this passage is that your heart is a battlefield. Your heart is a battlefield. Now, I know many of you are like, no, I listen, Jesus has my heart. Right? I'm going, I know where I'm going when I die. I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm ready to go. Right? And and I hope that's true. And 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 when you maybe the battle for your eternity has been settled. Right? We and, and that's that's nothing changes that. That's why the the angels the scripture says they, they celebrate when someone repents and believes because, hey, it's settled. The end, no matter what happens between now and then, you have an oper- you, you have your eternity sealed. It's all good, right? Um, but while the battle for your soul for eternity might be settled, the war has just begun, right? Like there's a, we ain't there yet, are we? And so we have between now and then, and there is a, a battle raging. And, and scripture says, that verse says, there are two forces that are constantly fighting each other in every believer. So we have two things going on here in your heart and in your mind and in your thoughts that affect your actions and your feelings and, and your life, right? So at salvation, when you do come to that point of salvation, when you do uh, receive the forgiveness and the new life, that, that comes by confessing Jesus as Lord and, and, and believing in his resurrection, then at that moment, Ephesians 1.13 says, when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. Now, some of your Bibles might say this, you, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, right? It's like he put a big old stamp on there. So Garrus is mine. Jason is mine. Holy Spirit. This is how I'm going to differentiate my, my children from the rest. And, and so we've been sealed in that. Jesus says in John 14, 16 through 17, that the Father will give you another advocate. He's talking to uh, his disciples right, right before he uh, ascends, right before he goes back to be with the Father. And he says, the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. This is who we're going to give you. You know him because he lives with you now and will later be in you. You see, at the time, even the ones that followed Jesus had only felt the Holy Spirit from the outside. There's been an external force. But, but there was this thing called Pentecost that happens in the book of Acts. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is all in your Cheerios as a Christian, right? It's not an outside thing. It's an in here thing. It's an in here thing, right? But also, you have another force coming at you. Romans 7, 23 says, there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me, which is really frustrating when you realize that, well, it was a couple weeks ago, we talked about how you don't have to obey those sins anymore. You don't have to do those sinful things anymore. You're not a slave to sin. And yet this force going on inside of you makes you think that you still have to be a slave to those things. Um, the New Living Translation was the, the version that I read. That's it's a translation that's meant to be read aloud and understood aloud, and so we. That's how I, why I usually preach from that. But um, the, the the phrase I learned it from is the flesh. It says sinful nature, but that's the same Greek word there for the flesh. It's what Romans eight seven and eight are talking about. For the mind that is set on the flesh or on that sinful nature is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So there's this force going on inside of you that 
when it's in control, when it's winning, then you, you can't please God with that. You're still saved. You're still valuable to Him. He still died for you, but you, you can't please God. You can't obey Him when there's this flesh going on. And Romans 7, 18 talks about it some more. He says, I know there's nothing good that dwells within me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. You ever thought that? Y'all ever had that in your mind? Like, I know what I need to do. I know what the Bible says. And this, this should, on paper, I should be doing this. But I don't know if I have the ability to do that. It sounds a lot like what he was saying in verse 17 of our passage today. You're not free to carry out your own good intentions. I like that translation. Good intentions. We got some good intentions, don't we? You know, I was really thinking about this. I really, I had a lot of good intentions for whatever the case may be, but good intentions uh, don't really do a whole lot of good if not that good when it doesn't actually change anything, right? And so just from what I'm, I'm getting and what I, as I read these verses, I seem to understand that we have these good intentions but there's something even more powerful going on in us, this spirit and this flesh that will overrule your good intentions, will overrun your head knowledge and your logic about what you ought to do. And you end up doing things that you don't want to do or not doing the things you know you need to. This might be why some of y'all can't figure out how to change your behavior. You're like, I'm saved now. I shouldn't be messing with this. I should, I should be better. I thought Jesus set me free from all this. And there's times where uh, you will even question your salvation. Am I, was this, do you need to dunk me again, pastor? Can we just hold me under a little longer this time to, to get it off me? Because I can't figure out why I'm doing the same things that I've always done. And, and, and by the way, I, nothing wrong with making sure you're saved, but also could it be you are in the flesh? That you have this flesh that is winning the war inside of you. And this is important for us to know. Not because I want to make you feel bad about yourself or all oh, this. Isn't, but, but the truth is, those not ready to fight are more likely to lose. If you don't know there's a war going on. If we knew there was a war going on outside these doors, are we just going to walk out and whistle and wave? No, we're going to get our head down. We're going to prepare ourselves. We're going to keep our head on a swivel. If you're not ready to fight then your flesh will kick your butt all day long. That good old flesh. Speaking of the flesh, let's talk about that old son of a gun. Uh, number two, your flesh will sabotage you. You have a saboteur. You have a mole in, uh, in, in the, not just a mole, but a mole. You got, some, you got somebody in there messing and meddling and sabotaging and pulling out wires and turning things over. Now, not to take away from the very real spiritual enemy we have, right? Like there are things going on. There are powers in this world and principalities that are coming up against the word of God. Don't get me wrong, but they're kind of nerfed when you think about it, right? God wins. We know they can only do so much, but most of the time the devil doesn't even have to get out of his armchair to deal with us. He doesn't even have to send his boys to mess up our day because we've already shot ourselves in the own foot with the flesh. Romans 7, 19. Is, I'll call this the most relatable verse in Scripture. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. You sabotage yourself. You're like, I know this is not what I want. Why do I keep doing this? And, and so you sabotage yourself in a million different ways. But I just, want, I just took a look at that, that list that Paul made there in Galatians 5. That's not, there's two lists. I don't know why they don't have paintings of the, the, uh, the fruits of the, the flesh. That's not quite as popular, but it's actually even longer and more in-depth than the fruits of the Spirit. But e even in that list there, there, I saw four different categories. for how, Four different ways we sabotage ourselves just from the examples that Paul gives us. Not on, not on top of all the stuff that we get up to. But... One way is, the first sabotage is you sabotage your relationship with yourself. I know that sounds like touchy-feely, like, I'm, I'm not seeing anyone I'm dating myself right now. That's not what I'm talking about here, okay? Your relationship with yourself is just how you, your thought life, your heart life, your emotions, and, and when you get in your flesh, you sabotage yourself. And the first three examples there are prime examples of how we sabotage ourselves. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. Now, I, I know that all sounds 
sexual in nature. They're not all, though. Like, sex is the obvious one. You, you don't have to think very hard about that to, to figure out how we can sabotage ourselves through sexual sin. Right? I would say go ask P. Diddy, but he's in jail because he did that exact thing. Right? That's a great example. I tried, Sorry. Sorry. Steve wasn't ready for that. Steve wasn't ready for that. Whoa! It's, you, you can sabotage all sorts of stuff. Your health, your finances, your through sexual immorality, right? But look at those other things. Those, I know they sound, sec- but impurity and lustful pleasures, you can lust for things other than sex, right? Like you can lust for comfort so much that you become lazy and you become selfish, right? And you start to sabotage yourself through your laziness and your selfishness. You can, you can lust after food for so much that you turn into a glutton, right? Those things start to sabotage our ourselves. That's the, the two dollar word for that is licentiousness. Ooh, it's a good word. Like, we're, we're licentious. We just the, the sins of the flesh, the food, the sex, the comfort. We we want that. And you're like, I'm not doing it. I hear that all the time. What you worried about people's sex lives? You're, they ain't hurting nobody. They're sabotaging themselves when we do that, when we sin in this way, when we sabotage our relationship with ourselves. Like why why <laughs> Good example of that is you've ever seen is it Godiva chocolates? They're always like it's, it's always some supermodel eating it all seductively. I'm like, why are you eating it like that? Like, well, why are you all seductive? Is it, you know, it's like because those things are connected, right? And so you sabotage your relationship with yourself when you you do things like that. But you also sabotage even more importantly your relationship with God. He gave a couple other examples of how we do that idolatry and sorcery if you were here with us what last year when we went all the way through the book of exodus and we talked a lot about idols how you don't have to have a little statue with a golden cow head on your mantelpiece that you bow down to to be an idolater those idols have just put on a new veneer but it's the same heart of worshiping things that you should be worshiping god for right and and so we we can all be idolaters but i bet none of you thinks you're a sorcerer like I don't know, Harry Potter cooking up spells in a cauldron. Like I know it's near Halloween, but like I don't have to worry about sorcery, do I? Well, funny enough, the again, go back to the Greek word that, that was translated sorcery is pharmakia. Sounds like pharmacy. Sounds like dr- your dare officer has entered the chat now, right? Like he is <laughs> Why? Because there's issues with that. I'm not saying you can't go to the pharmacy, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that. Sometimes we rely on other powers and other substances to get from God, get for ourselves what God should be the source of. And we end up sabotaging our relationship with him. When, when our idolatry and our sorcery and our reliance on whether prescription or otherwise, you know, other substances like that take the place of God, we sabotage our relationship. We do that when we're in our flesh. Even Christians do that. It also spills out into your relationship with others, right? The other, this is the all right. It's a little, it's a little easier to, to hide your sabotage of your those first two relationships. But when you really get out of control is when you sabotage your relationship with other people. When you're in your flesh so much, no one wants to be around you, right? Every we all think it's everybody else's problem. Why don't I have any friends? Maybe you're in your flesh 24 seven and you're selfish and nobody wants to be around hostility and quarreling and jealousy and anger and outbursts of anger and selfish ambition and all these things like that. You don't, you sabotage your, you can't have relationships with other people in healthy ways when your flesh is what's driving all that you do. And when all those things go unchecked, you end up sabotaging your reputation. That's when Paul talked about drunkenness and wild parties and stuff like that. He's talking about when you've been in your flesh so long, everybody can see it. It's not just your close friends. It's not just your family. You have sabotaged yourself so much. You're like, oh, there they come. They're probably drunk. They're probably into something. They're probably having a wild party. Those are just great examples of how you can sabotage your reputation when you are always in your flesh. You see how this list gets worse and worse and and worse? Because the longer the flesh goes unattacked and unassailed, the stronger it gets and the, and the wider the blast radius is. You see, this is why we need to know what the flesh is all about. Because this is what's going on in Christians. 
We love to think about what the rest of the world is up to. This stuff's going on in the house of the Lord, in the people of God, in the family of God. But I say that to say this. I don't, I don't want to just make you feel like you're, there's no hope. Because this can be over so, so easy to go, yes, I'm dealing with this. I don't have any hope. Well, see, here's the difference between believers and those that don't have that thing called the Holy Spirit. Because number three, your spirit brings you victory. Your spirit brings you victory. I know I just said, you just, we just read those verses. I just can't do what's right. Yeah, when you're in your flesh. When you're holding, when you've jumped to that side of the battle. Yeah, you can't. But you have this thing called the Spirit of God that has promised us victory. Romans 8, 14 says, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You have that in you. And if you're led by that Spirit, you don't have to do the things of the flesh. We'll begin to act and look like our Heavenly Father when we submit to being led by His Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You're not too weak. Yeah, maybe you're too weak to overcome your flesh, but you have the power of the Holy Spirit at your disposal that brings power and victory. The battle is not won by human grit. And, and just you're just going to and all that you have in you apart from God. Your human efforts don't bring you victory. But the supernatural, powerful work of the Holy Spirit, of the living God that was given to you when you said yes to Jesus is what you need for victory. So let's make a battle plan. Because I know that sounds like, all right, that's it. Go to Jesus. I'll see y'all later. Right? Very easy to, to stop there. But what's the battle plan? Okay, we can win. When I know we can win, I want, to, I want to know what we need to do to win. And so, real quick, just we're going to finish off today with the battle plan for victory. Here's, here's step one. Crucify your flesh. That's so violent. Why do you have to talk so violently? Well, that's what Galatians 5.24 says. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. Colossians 3.5 goes on to say, put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. And then he goes on actually to list a lot of the same things that he talked about in the fruit of the flesh. We got to stop looking at our flesh like that guilty pleasure. Like, well, I'm going to keep it around a little bit and take it out when nobody's looking. I'm going to jump on that side for a little while, but it'll be mostly spirit, right? Stop playing patty cake with your flesh, right? It's, it's, don't send it to timeout. Oh, you've been naughty. Right? Don't, don't give it a strongly worded email or a demerit. Kill it where it stands with no mercy because it's either kill or be killed when it comes to the flesh. There was a this smart old dead guy named John Owen that says, kill sin or sin will be killing you. There's really no choice in the matter. We have to crucify our flesh. That is a, that is a vivid... It, it's, I know you're going... Crucifying was how Jesus died. And probably for the same reason he used that word. Because it needs to be brutal. It needs to be thorough. You need to crucify your flesh. And then you need to step two, ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit and heal your desires. If you're going to attack the flesh, you're going to need the Holy Spirit. And you're going, I'm a Christian, I already have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but you know what we do to the Holy Spirit a lot of times? We put it in the cabinet and stuff it away we, we we quench it the bible says right when we when we give into the flesh it, it needs a power up it, we need god to top us off a little bit with that holy spirit and so when we do that we need to ask him to heal our desires the way to change your behavior is to change your heart so i mean you're trying to change your actions but you're doing what you want to do You've got a heart that says, I want to do this. And so you're probably, even when you fight it, you're going to do that. We need to ask God to give us new desires. First, go back to verse 17. The Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. If you're in the Spirit, when you're asking God to fill you with the Spirit, you also should be going, and God, make me want to do what's right. I think secretly, some of us don't want to want to. We, we, we've wanted these things, these fleshly things for so long that we're just going to, I'll do something differently as long as it makes everybody else happy and helps me to sleep at night. No, ask God to give you a new desire. 
to not want to look at that website anymore, to not want to open that bottle anymore or light that thing up anymore or whatever the case may be. God, give me a different desire. Change my heart and then your actions will follow suit. It's a supernatural thing, but it's available to us. And then step number three, we need to, we need to protect your heart and your mind. You, we've, we've attacked the flesh We've powered up with the Holy Spirit, and now we need to move forward protecting our heart and mind. Romans 8, 5 and 6 says, Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Some of y'all are already, you've already shot yourself in the foot because of what's going on up here. Before you leave the door in the morning, before you roll out of bed in the morning, you're, you're already unprotected. You're already heading towards the flesh. We need to protect our heart and mind. Galatians 5.25 says, Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. All of it. Stop compartmentalizing. Well, I can be in the flesh over here, but I'll do really good over here, and, and that way it'll even out. No, that's not how this flesh works. Flesh takes over. It's, it's kind of a, an all or nothing type thing. Either you're serving and, and battling for the flesh, or you're serving and battling for the Spirit. I know we like to be well balanced. Let's think about it like this. I know I'm the one to be using a gym analogy here, but let's say you go to the gym, all right, to work out, to protect yourself, protect spiritually. We need to go to the gym and look like this, <laughs> right? That's how, that's how your inside should look, right? They skipped leg day, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. You see, I mean, there's, I was going to use a real person's uh, picture, but I was like, that's too mean. That's I'm sorry. I've seen some guys that aren't much different than that. But I want your spirit to be ripped, to be well-fed, to be strengthened, and your flesh to be starved. That's how you protect your heart and your mind. Before you even get close, I'm not scared about getting kicked by a leg like that. Right? Your flesh, that should be your flesh. It'll be there. It'll be nagging it, but it's going to be like, oh, that's pathetic flesh. The flesh is going to throw something at you, a thought or an opportunity, and you're going to be like, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> and then you take the spirit and go, pow! Right? Because you're, you have built the spirit up so much, and you have starved your flesh, that it stops becoming a big deal, doesn't it? Calm down, Tilly. It's okay. <laughs> so how do we do that, though? Well, it starts in prayer, Right? Like, again, when you wake up, boy, and by the way, this is when I point my finger, my old Sunday school teacher used to say, I point one at you, I got three fingers pointing back at me. But what, what do you do when you roll over in the morning? And you're already in the flesh. Because you're, you're already going, and, and, ooh. And, and all of a sudden, you're in your flesh. And then you get up, and then you think you're going to treat your spouse right? You're going to treat your co-workers right? You're going to treat your family right? Because you've rolled out of the bed and got into the flesh? Maybe you need to roll out of bed and go, Lord, thanks for waking me up. First off, didn't have to do that. Appreciate that. But also, uh, let's just get down to business. Kill my flesh. Crucify, slaughter my flesh. Get rid of it. Starve it. Break it. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. Because I don't want to screw this up by the time I get to the breakfast table. By the way, this is not a one-time thing. Y'all, you're going to have to rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. As much as necessary. Some days you're having a great day, you only have to do it a couple times. Other days you're just cycling through it. Just, kill that and kill that and kill them. No, don't kill them, but kill that. <laughs> but you're going to have to use that whenever necessary. Why is this important? This, there's consequences that come with that. Did you see what Galatians 5.21 said? Anyone that's living that sort of fleshly life will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not me. It's the Bible that says that. I know we think, well, I can get away with it. I'll push it to the limit. By the way, I've been there. I'm not, but I'll push it to the limit with my flesh and then pull back right when I need to. Anyone living that sort of life misses out on the kingdom of God. Now, let me be clear because that word kingdom of God gets misinterpreted. This is important. This doesn't mean you lose your salvation. If you get in the flesh this morning, if you're in your flesh this morning, doesn't mean you're going to hell necessarily, right? 
It means you lose the effects and the blessings of the fruit of the Spirit. The kingdom of heaven is here and now. The kingdom of God can be this room. It can be in your car. It can be at your job and at your school. Remember, if you want to go back, beginning of the year, we had that kingdom mindset series. The kingdom is not just far off forever. It's right now. And so when he says you're missing out on the kingdom of God, he doesn't mean, oh, you're going to hell. Oh, you're in your flesh. You're going to hell now. I've got to re re get saved. No, what he means is you're missing it. Because there are good results. The kingdom of God, the, the, the Spirit of God produces what? Joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the results. This is what can mark your life. I, I'm, I'm lighting up your flesh today because this is what I want for you. This is what I want for me. I want us to have this kind of fruit in our lives. I want us to experience love like God intended us to. Deep, abiding, meaningful love. Not just, hey, love you, see you later. But love that heals. Love that sustains. Joy. Not just happiness and entertainment, but a joy that is so deep that it's not contended on us having a good day for us to be in a good mood. Peace. Now, this world needs peace. Wouldn't it be great if you could walk out in this crazy world and have peace? To have patience? These are good things that we want in our lives. You will not have it unless you crucify your flesh and are filled with the Holy Spirit and you protect your heart and mind. This is something that you can do every day. God doesn't go, you've, you've used your prayers for today. Sorry, try again tomorrow. No. No. As many times as you can, you can attack your flesh. Because guess what? The more you attack your flesh, the weaker it gets. That flesh that's raging so strong in you right now, if you kill it repeatedly for the next year or two, it's going to be considerably less formidable. And you'll be a lot closer to the fruits of the Spirit. One more thing before we wrap up and we sing one more song is, this is, I don't know if you noticed, I've been talking to Christians. Christians have this duality going on with the spirit and, and the flesh. But if you're not a Christian, you're all flesh. Right? The flesh is really that zombie remnant of who you were. Right? That should have died and stayed in the grave, but unfortunately keeps coming back like it's Halloween every day to, to haunt us a little bit. But that's the old you, but... If, you, if you're not in Christ, that's you. And what hope do you have? Again, we're hopeless. Christians are hopeless without the Holy Spirit. How, are you, how do you think you're going to do this without the Spirit of God that lives in you? Ephesians 2, 3-5 says, All of us used to live that way. This fleshly way where we're following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our flesh. By our very nature. You're like, I'm just... A lot of people don't like that. I'm good at heart. I'm good in my nature. No, by your very nature, you were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy. He loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. That's what we need. That's the hope we hang our hat on. That's the way that we overcome these things because Jesus did it first. And so if you are not in Christ, let me remind you. He's making you this offer. That if you will repent of your sins, if you will acknowledge where you're at, if you'll say, God, I know I'm broken and the only, by, only way that I can be fixed is through your son, Jesus. And the Bible says, if you confess that he is king, you confess with he is, that he is Lord with your mouth and then you believe in your heart, that this resurrection thing is not just a metaphor, but that He actually overcame death with life so that we can have eternal life, then at that moment, the skies might not quake, the, the lights might not flicker, but the Holy Spirit of God enters into your mind, into the inner being of who you are, and you are different. And then, the sky's the limit. And then, we can have the fruit of the Spirit. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you an opportunity. And I know that there's a million reasons that, that, that we say, no, 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 that's not right. I'm, I'm fine the way I am. 
This world is, is designed to make you think that you're fine the way you are. And the reason that is is because it's the anti-gospel. But in reality, we need to know what's going on here. We need to know that, that our relationships with our, our Creator are broken until we have Christ. And so, if you need to surrender to Him, it's not a it's, it's a whole lot simpler than it appears. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus to make this possible for you, but it is quite simple. You just got to say yes to His invitation. And so if, if you've never done that, and it's no better time than right now to say, God, forgive me. God, I know, I didn't realize maybe until just right now that, that I was broken, but I know I need to be fixed. And self-help won't do it. And these other things won't do it. My own efforts aren't going to fix me. God, fix me. Make me the way you designed me to be. So that I can be in a relationship with you. So I can finally have the purpose that I was created for. And when you ask God for that, that's a prayer He answers with a yes every time. And for those of you that have had that moment, maybe it was just recently, maybe it was decades ago. And yes, your eternity is settled. But we've been asleep at the wheel. We've been got our heads in the sand when it comes to the war that we're in. And it's raging inside of you. And so, maybe this is the, the moment for you to pick up the fight again. Maybe it's starting to make sense why things haven't sh shaked out the way you thought. That you don't have that closeness. You don't have that joy and peace and patience and kindness that, that you keep reading about. Maybe you need to develop a hatred for your flesh. Because it's your enemy. You know, it would be one thing if you didn't have access to God. But if you're a Christian, if you're the Holy Spirit of God, it's in you. It's there. It's available to you. Why would we not use it? And so, I'm going to pray a prayer, a violent prayer over you. It's going to be a, a prayer that totally, if, if you will join me in it, you're joining me in, in spiritual violence against your flesh. But it's necessary. Because I'm convinced that most people have not been hurt by God. They've been hurt by Christians in the flesh. Church hurt most of the time is just fleshly Christians doing what their flesh tells them to do. I'm tired of there being collateral damage for our flesh. I'm tired of it robbing our peace of mind and our relationship with our Heavenly Father and, and fracturing our friendships and our family relationships. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of us sabotaging ourselves and doing our enemy's job for him. Oh God, would you just crucify our flesh? Lord, we repent of that, that dead part of us that still got a hand on the wheel. God, give us a hatred of that. And give us a, a deep desire and a longing for your spirit to overwhelm us. God, break out our spirit from whatever back cupboard closet we've stuck it in. That spirit that you gave to us on salvation. And fill us. Amplify that spirit within us. Lord, may we start making this decision day in and day out. May we start living like we believe. May we start thinking like someone whose mind has been renewed and feeling like people whose hearts have been renewed. And God, help us to see that it's, it's not just about changing our behavior. It's about changing our hearts. God, change our hearts. You know exactly in what way each and every one of us need to have our heart changed here this morning. Lord, would you do it? Not because we deserve it, but because that's what you do and, and you deserve that glory and honor and praise.
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.